With more than 6,000 small and micro cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the Virtual Roadshow series presented by Channel Check. This roadshow features Boris Ellisman, President and CEO of ACO Brands, NYSE ticker symbol ACCO. Following a formal presentation, he is joined by Joe Gomes, Senior Research Analyst for Noble Capital Markets, a FINRA-licensed SEC-registered broker-dealer, for a Q&A session featuring questions that were submitted by the live audience. You can find Noble's research on ACO Brands on channelcheck.com or by clicking the link in the description. With that, I am pleased to present Boris Ellisman. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, great to be here, and thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, this afternoon for uh, Noble Capital Markets Virtual Roadshow. As Chris said, the company is Echo Brands, and my name is Boris Ellisman. I'm the chairman and uh, CEO of the company. And uh, today I will go through a, a strategy presentation in our business, and then uh, uh, Joe and I will be happy to take, uh, your, or I'll be happy to take uh, Joe's and, and your questions. We are, as I said, Echo Brands, a leading global designer, marketer, and manufacturer of recognized brands used in homes, schools, and businesses. This slide shows some of the pertinent facts about our company. Despite a challenging environment, our company performed relatively well in 2020, and the business is recovering nicely through the second half of uh, last year and into 2021. At the end of last year, we acquired Power A, a maker of accessories for video gaming consoles. 2020 revenue, adjusted EBITDA, and geographic mix are shown as both reported and pro forma numbers, considering the impact of the acquisition. Our portfolio has several iconic global brands well known to consumers of home, school, and business products around the world. These brands include At A Glance, Five Star, Quartet, and Swing Line in North America, Lights Acelte, Repeat and Rexel in Europe, Talibra in Brazil, and GBC, Kensington, and Powerade globally. These 12 brands represent 75% of our annual sales and are the biggest area for demand generation and innovation investments. We're very well distributed with significant shelf and online market shares with most resellers who carry our types of products. Top 10 customers represented 44% of our sales in 2020 with no single customer with over 10% of sales. In the last few years, we saw significant channel transition to broadline retailers, e-tailers, and independent dealers from big box specialty office channels. This transition has been a headwind to sales because the growing channels are more efficient and carry less inventory than the declining channels. In addition, in response to lower sales, the declining channels have been closing stores and shifting to private label, which further reduces sales. This transition, while still playing out, is having less impact on our business now due to smaller aggregate size of the declining customers. That combined with economic recovery that we're currently seeing in North America and Europe and the expected economic recovery in the rest of the world later in the year and 2022 creates significant potential for sales growth and shareholder value creation. We're a market leader in the categories where we compete. Approximately 75% of our sales come from brands with market leading positions. We have strong presence across multiple product categories, technology categories of computer and gaming accessories represented 
of our pro forma sales in 2020 and combined are the biggest and fastest growing categories in our business. They performed well even during the COVID recession last year. Writing, drawing, tools, and wellness categories also performed well as consumers worked in, played in, and repaired their homes. School products were negatively impacted as schools were closed for much of the year, especially in North America. Schools have now reopened, and we expect this year's back to school season to be good. We expect this category will continue to rebound next year as well. Storage and organization, laminating, shredding, binding, and other categories were negatively impacted from office closures in 2020, but are now also beginning to recover as more employees are returning back to office. We, expel, we expect sales of these categories to grow this year and in 22. We have been executing the strategy of transforming our business towards faster growing consumer and technology products, both organically and through acquisitions. Organically, we've expanded the Five Star, Kensington, and Derwin product ranges and introduced the TrueSense brand for wellness products. Inorganically, we've done five, five acquisitions in the last five years to grow our consumer product and channel portfolios in Europe, Australia, Brazil, Mexico, and the US. We've continued to shift our channel investments towards e-tail, retail, and direct-to-consumer and away from big box specialty resellers. And acquisitions help further diversify our customer base. Throughout all of this, we've been managing our costs and improving the productivity of our assets. We normally save about $30 million per year for productivity programs. Last year, due to COVID, we implemented additional cost reduction initiatives, including temporary pay cuts, and achieved $83 million in savings. This year, we expect more normal range of productivity savings. Each year, we generate significant free cash flow, and we deploy it in a balanced way to benefit shareholders. Part of the free cash flow we've used for acquisitions to transform our business, part to repurchase shares and reduce our outstanding share count by 17% since 2014, part to repay dividends or pay dividends, and part to deliver. This year, we plan to use our free cash flow for dividends and to reduce the incremental debt taken for the latest acquisition. Acquisitions are an important part of our strategy to grow shareholder value. We've been performing our business for the last few years from what was largely a North American office products business to a more global consumer products business with well-known and user products. We evaluate our acquisitions along strategic and financial criteria summarized on this page. We look at many potential candidates, but only few pass our filters. Over the last five years, we've done one acquisition per year, which includes our latest significant acquisition closed in December. The company we acquired is called Power A. Power A is a leading third party provider of gaming controllers, headsets, and charging stations for Microsoft Xbox, Sony PlayStation and Nintendo Switch video gaming platforms. Last year, they grew sales 25% to $210 million and delivered a 23% EBITDA. Looking at our strategic and financial criteria, Power A met or exceeded all of our objectives. The business has strong growth record and future growth opportunities due to the underlying strength of the video ga gaming market. The incremental potential to gain share in some of the underpenetrated categories and to leverage ACO's market presence in Europe and other international countries. Their products enjoy leading market share positions and their value is well recognized by both retailers and end consumers. 
Powerade's distribution is in faster growing channels and further diversifies ACO's consumer portfolio. Lastly, on the strategic criteria, this acquisition gives us another platform to make further acquisitions in the future. From a financial perspective, Powerade will be accretive to EPS and cash flow and provides a return on invested capital greater than our WAC, weighted average cost of capital. It's been five months since we've owned Powerade, and I'm very happy with their business performance and the status of integration of our organizations. If I had one complaint, I'd like to have more products. Demand is outstanding, and our teams are working hard to chase supply. The addition of Powerade further shifts our product portfolio to faster growing consumer school and technology products. On a pro forma basis, 58% of our 2020 sales fell in those categories. Slower growing and declining commercial categories were 42% of sales. Powerade also shifts our channel profile further in the growth direction with 52% of sales coming from faster growing e-tail, retail, and technology channels. As part of our shift to more consumer-centric categories, we're investing in product innovation and brand development. We have refreshed many of our lines and entered new product categories to fuel organic growth of the business. I'll give you a few examples of these innovations in the next several slides. I'll start with a line of consumer air purifiers that we introduced two years ago under the TrueSense brand. Residential air purification is a large and growing market, and the data here is before COVID-19, which greatly expanded the market. TrueSense purifiers have several compelling differentiators including the remote sensor pod, which measures air quality at point of preference and adjusts the intensity of air purifier depending on that air quality. TrueSense is now a $25 million product category for us and is still growing. We plan to further expand this line with additional products over the coming months. Within computer accessories, which we sell under Kensington brand, we annually introduce 50 to 70 products per year focused on improving personal productivity. Docking stations was our biggest line of Kensington products in 2020, growing by well over 100% year on year, as businesses, governments, and consumers purchase docks to improve laptop connectivity and productivity. We offer a full line of docks for Windows and Chrome laptops, MacBooks, Surface tablets, and this year we introduced an award-winning dock for the Apple iPad. Shredders is another large category for our company, traditionally sold under the GBC and Rexel brands. Lights is one of our top global brands and the biggest brand in Europe. It stands for premium German engineering with corresponding quality, reliability, and design. In 2019, we introduced a line of shredders under the Lights brand and consistent with its brand promise. These models were very well accepted by the market and Lights is now one of the top shredder brands in Germany. Responding to the shift to working from home, we introduced several lights ranges of desktop accessories and home office supplies designed to fit the decor of a contemporary apartment or home. These products feature premium design, on-trend colorways, and richly textured materials. The line is a commercial success and won a prestigious Red Dot Design Award earlier this year. And last year, 
we launched Light's WOW range of white and brightly colored storage products, which are also in very high demand. Fueled by innovative products, Light's continues its strong growth in 2021. Much of our investments in product innovation and demand generation come from productivity savings we generate in the business. Every year, our teams come up with many dozens of Lean Six Sigma based projects, which in the aggregate add to a substantial annual savings. Most of our productivity projects focus on reducing COGS. Our medium term range for gross margins is 33 to 34%. We used to be in that range a couple of years ago until incremental U.S. tariffs and COVID impact on volumes reduced our gross margins to 29.7% last year. We believe volume recovery, pricing actions to offset inflation, and productivity initiatives will get us back to our target range in the medium term. Some productivity initiatives are focused on reducing SG&A. Our SG&A is about 50 bips higher than our target of 19.5%, which we believe we can get to in a relatively short order. Our capital structure is depicted on this slide. As a result of borrowing to acquire Power A, we have about $1.2 billion of gross debt and 1.1 billion of net debt. Approximately 50% of our debt is fixed on secured notes with 4.25% interest due in 2029. The other 50% is variable bank debt, which matures in 2026. Our weighted average interest rate on debt is 3.25%. This year, our top priority is to pay down some of the bank debt to the risk the business and give us additional financial flexibility. The company generates significant free cash flow, averaging approximately $170 million per year from 2017 through 2019. In 2020, we took a hit due to COVID and its effect on sales and profits. We forecast a partial recovery this year to $135 million and a further recovery in 2022, when we'll also realize an incremental $25 million of free cash flow from Power A. To summarize, we're a market leading company that represents a compelling opportunity for shareholders to for shareholder value creation. Invest with us as we transform our company. Thank you, Boris. Great presentation. I am Joe Gomes, the Noble Capital Senior Analyst who covers ACO Brands. Here are the questions I've selected from the audience, as well as a few of my own. So let, let's talk first, Boris, on the, the key um, school market. Um, you know, what, what are you kind of seeing in terms of schools uh, reopening on a worldwide basis? And, you know, how does back to school look for North America for this fall? Um, you know, things are looking good. Uh, what we saw throughout, uh, the uh, spring, uh, more and more schools were uh, going in person, and by the time schools were out in uh, May timeframe, roughly 70% of the schools were uh, meeting five days a week in person, uh, another 20% uh, in a hybrid mode, uh, and only 10% um, uh, uh, were, were remote. Uh, we expect that for this back to school, uh, which, by the way, is starting actually a little bit earlier because some of these school districts want to get their kids in uh, a couple of weeks earlier than, than they traditionally go. But we expect that for this back to school, a vast majority of uh, schools will be five days in person, uh, and that's both uh, in the U.S. and uh, in uh, Canada. Um, and that's the majority of our North American uh, uh, back to school uh, sales. If you look at uh, the other uh, countries 
where back to school is a significant business for us, and namely uh, Brazil uh, and Australia. Uh, they go to school on a Southern Hemisphere calendar, which which is you know school start uh, call it uh, end of January, early February timeframe. So the back to school season for us is end of the year, early uh, next year. And right now we expect that. Um, Australia will be fully in person. They have been throughout. Uh, they're they're uh, managing their um, uh, COVID relatively well, despite some of the uh, recent challenges. Uh, so their schools actually never closed, and 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 certainly we expect that back to school season to be uh, normal. Uh, Brazil uh, last year really didn't have a back to school because schools were closed. Uh, uh, Brazil is still uh, suffering from COVID. Uh, but things are improving a little bit there. And certainly the expectation is that uh, uh, more schools will reopen uh, come uh, come this fall. But that's something that we still need to uh, we still need to monitor. Okay, thank you for that. And you know let's kind of follow along there, you know two two areas that really have been hit hard um, from COVID have been Mexico and Brazil. And just kind of get an idea of you know what steps you've been taking and you, kind of your viewpoint on those two markets when you think they might start to recover. Uh, we, you know we're seeing recovery uh, as we speak. Uh, certainly compared to prior year, we're seeing a recovery because the in Q2 of last year, uh, and, and in Q1 uh, at the end of Q1 of last year, they they their sales took a big hit uh, as they were uh, closing down due to COVID. Uh, so we are seeing. Uh, a recovery, uh, but we don't expect it to approach pre-COVID uh, conditions until you know next year at the earliest. I think this this throughout this year there'll be a it'll be a rebuilding year, but things are certainly improving there. It's just it's not certainly not back to normal. Okay, and let, let's switch gears um, a little bit here. You know, how, how do you think offices will be used as the pandemic wanes and you know, how, how do, what does that mean for ACO and in, in its brands and in, in sales? Yeah, you know, our expectation is that uh, uh, certainly the world will be different and, and uh, um, it will not go back to uh, the pre-COVID conditions. We believe that um, probably 70 to 80 percent of the offices will be um, either uh, hybrid or fully in person. In another, you know, 20 percent or so, maybe in the uh, fully remote situation. Um, you know, hybrid, uh, 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 hybrid especially, we think will be the majority of configurations. Uh, and um, you know, that means uh, a couple of days uh, a week in the office, a couple of days a week at home. Uh, and we think that it presents a potential opportunity for us on the sales front, as people will want to replicate what they have. Uh, in their office back in their homes, so it could potentially actually drive uh, an increase uh, consumption in use of our types of products, certainly an increased sale of our types of products. Uh, we're seeing uh, the uh, office market recover as more people are going uh, are going back uh, to the office, so sales are recovering. Again, I don't expect them to be uh, at uh, pre-COVID levels until, until uh, later on. Uh, when uh, more and more people go back uh, in a hybrid mode, uh, but we are seeing a strong recovery there as we speak. That's good. And, and you know, a lot, lot of news around supply chain uh, and inflation. You know, how does the Ackle brand supply chain look? Um, you know, what do you see in terms of inflation, and how are you responding to it? Um, we manufacture uh, uh, products uh, in the countries where we sell them uh, roughly 40 to 50 percent of our volume is, is in the country uh, manufacturing in the country that we, we sell in and the other um, 50 to 60 percent uh, we uh, import uh, majority of that is coming from from asia uh, we are seeing uh, increasing inflation uh, both domestically uh, and and out of Asia, we're seeing uh, most of it on uh, freight, on inbound freight. Um, the container costs are very high. 
Um, some of the transportation is high uh, due to the price of oil, um, you know, doubling from last year and increasing 50% from beginning of, the, of this year. Uh, we're seeing some uh, commodity uh, inflation. We're seeing uh, some labor uh, in inflation, especially on uh, temp labor that we need to, uh, to hire for seasonal uh, parts of our business. So inflation is definitely picking up. Um, you know, we plan to uh, pass that through to uh, our consumers. We've done a couple of price increases in the U.S., for example, already. We've done several internationally. And our plan is to do more in the remainder of this year uh, because what we've done earlier does not account for all of the incremental cost increases that we've seen so far. So following along on that, you, you did mention earlier that, you know, on, and the some of the slower growing channels, there's been a switch to private label. You know, how are you, you know, balancing increasing prices um, and not having that switch to private label increase faster than what you want? Uh, private label uh, is, a, for us, it's about, six seven percent of our business so it's a it's a small non-strategic component for our business um for, from our standpoint uh we've uh, kind of absorbed over the last uh, uh several years uh the major shifts to private label uh we, we we really don't participate uh in those uh price points today so um to a significant extent uh, it doesn't really um, affect that much of our business. In addition, uh, most of private label, and I'm talking about 90% plus, uh, are products that are imported from Asia. And given what I just said about both costs and supply chain delays in getting products out of Asia, there's actually a demand on domestically manufactured products uh, on us as well as some other manufacturers that do it domestically. So uh, in, in a way, current challenges are uh, helping us uh, regain some sales uh, from, from these channels that are shifting more and more to private label. Okay, thank you for that. Let's talk about uh, Kensington for a moment, if we can. I believe last year, you know, part of what drove that significant sales increase is you, you won a big contract. Um, I wouldn't expect that to be repeated every year. So if we put that aside for a second, um, how is that business doing and what, what's driving growth there today? Uh, Kensington continues to perform really, really well, Joe. And if you, if you put aside that uh, major contract that we won, it continues to grow at double digit rates um, and uh, is expanding globally. And the demand for its products is really driven by um, growth in the laptops. And, uh, you know, if you looked at Gartner IDC information, um, you know, recent uh, quarters have been record quarters for laptop sales. Um, so that attracts uh, the whole ecosystem of accessories as accessorized laptops to make it more uh, productive. So that's a big driver uh, of their demand. And the other one, is um, work from home as again as people equip uh, their home offices they buy more laptop docks keyboards mice uh, ergonomic products security products that that, that kensington sells so um, you know kensington's been performing really well in the last uh, few years and it certainly continues into 2021 good and Power A, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that integration is going. You know, has the chip shortage we've all heard about, you know, uh, impacting the business? You, know, you did mention, you know, you're chasing supply there on, the, on that side. So if you could just talk a little bit more there and provide a little more color, we'd appreciate it. Sure. So we now own Power A for about six months. Uh, really happy with uh, the business performance and with the team. Uh, the integration going well. Um, we are in the middle of uh, the last few steps before we transition uh, from the um, legacy parent company 
uh, providing some of the backend services to Echo Brands, providing some of the backend services. That's going to that transition will happen in the next uh, a couple of months, uh, and that's going really well uh, as well. Um, there is definitely a semiconductor um, chip shortage globally, not just for uh, the gaming industry, but you you've read about this for. Uh, consumer electronics for automobile manufacturers it's it's pretty prevalent uh, throughout um, it does affect powerrays ecosystem some of the console makers um, are having uh, a problem supplying their products to consumers so, you know whether it's Xbox or uh, or PlayStation or a Nintendo switch uh, powerrays specifically has been managing um, Ship, the chip shortage fairly well. Uh, we're able to place uh, orders well ahead of time, and uh, we're getting the allocation that we need uh, to support to support the demand for our products. That's good news. And I, I know this is you know real early, given that we're still digesting the Power A integration. Um, but what other areas was you look forward? You know, could you see ACO expanding into, you know, what are the kind of adjacencies to the existing uh, product base? Um, you know, we're really uh, looking at uh, areas that have uh, underlying uh, growth characteristics. So the market is growing, uh, that um, has strong brands and provides the ability to differentiate and hence have, you know, decent gross margins. Uh, in the business, and right now we're also focused on um, primarily developed markets. Uh, we think that uh, with with COVID and the recovery, it will take a little bit of time for the emerging markets to get their footing back. So our focus is primarily on uh, consumer products, growing categories in uh, in domestic markets, and obviously there'll have to be a um, a reason why we are a better owner of the asset than than, than the somebody else. It has to be some kind of a strategic leverage, and uh, obviously good financial returns, as I showed in one of the slides. Right, right. So, what what are your expectations of organic growth over the near term, and do you think you'll be able to offset uh, the declining categories? We're expecting strong organic growth in the business, Joe, in the near term. So if I look at the next, I know, so let me just address longer term for a second, and then I can compare near term with the longer term. In the longer term, we expect to grow the company with GDP, so organically. So call it 2 to 3% per year um, on average. In the near term, and I'm talking about this year and next year, we expect to grow our company a lot faster than that, a lot stronger than that. Uh, as we're rebounding from uh, the uh, the COVID recession. So strong growth in the near term and then getting to some kind of a GDP growth in the longer term. Okay, great. And quick question here, you know, you, you, you talk about some of the uses of cash, um, you know, dividends, paying down debt, you know, you, you have in the past been active on the repurchase side. Um, you know, and if we look at, you know, the, the company's stock price, it's been kind of stuck in that, you know, let's call it six to 10 range here for a while. Um, could you see the company doing um, more on the repurchase side? Or do you think that, you know, that's kind of be an arrow left in the quiver right now as you focus on just uh, reducing leverage? Well, you know, I wouldn't rule anything out, Joe. Never say never, and uh, you know, clearly it depends on uh, the stock price. Uh, but but our priorities in the near term uh, is to um, fund the dividend and to deliver the business. Uh, we expect to get to less than three and a half times net debt to EBITDA uh, ratio by the end of the year. Uh, and that's close enough for us to start looking at share repurchases. So, um, you know, I think I think of the next few months, uh, the focus is is is, is definitely um, on uh, reducing debt. But 
you know, I wouldn't rule anything out come, come end of the year. And what is kind of your leverage target? Our target is to be between two and two and a half times. Uh, we think that is uh, the uh, best ratio for us. Uh, and, you know, we were at 2.6 times uh, back uh, at the end of 2019. You know, obviously with COVID and with the acquisition of Power A, our uh, net, uh, net leverage ratios uh, went up. Uh, we were at uh, four and a half times at the end of Q1. But we do generate significant free cash flow and with a focus on uh, delivering, I feel very confident in our ability to get to below three and a half. And at that level, you know, everything is game. Even though we are still focusing on reducing the ratio down to two and a half times, um, you know, it's not a big reach from three and a half to two and a half. And uh, we're gonna be looking at the other things such as uh, share of purchases you mentioned if uh, if the pr price of the stock is so low. Okay, one final one for you, Boris, here. Best guess, when will sales and profits reach or exceed 2019 levels? Sales should uh, exceed 2019 levels this year. You don't have to wait too long. So it's, uh, um, I'm very confident in that. Uh, profits likely 2022, uh, because we did, take on you know, additional interest payments, additional uh, uh, intangible amortization uh, with, with the acquisition. Uh, there is inflation, uh, uh, et cetera. So I think profits will have to wait till uh, 2022, but, but sales this year. Thank you for joining us for this virtual roadshow presentation brought to you by Channel Check. View our YouTube channel for more video content, including C-suite interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and 6,000 other small and microcap companies.